job, good job. Great song, great job. If you would, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. If you need a Bible, there may be one in the seat in front of you. 1 Corinthians 15. If you have a bulletin or if you want to grab like an offering envelope, I want you to write something down. Uh, there should be room on the uh, bulletin. So we're 1 Corinthians 15. And I want you to write something down. Just write it so that you'll understand it. But if I was dying right now and I had 15 minutes to live and I was not a believer, I'd never come to church and I wanted to be saved, what would you tell me to do? I wanted to be saved, what would you tell me to do? Just write that down. What would you tell me to do if I needed to be saved? Hopefully you could write just a few words to give you some guidelines there. So just hold on to that for a little bit. Paul is dealing with another issue in the Corinthian church. This whole book basically has been Paul. He found out several issues they had and problems they were having, questions they had. And he's going through them one at a time. He's also adding his own wisdom from the Lord on this. But the key here is they have started to doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ okay they've started to doubt that now they had believed in it you can't be saved without believing that Jesus rose from the dead bodily actually okay? you can't be saved according to Romans 10 9 you can't well they had started uh, not believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus and they were saying this well maybe he spiritually rose I mean on the cross he did say father into your hands I commit my spirit so they said well maybe it's kind of quibbling over small matters if whether he rose physically doesn't matter but at least he rose spiritually and um, and so maybe they thought that they were also saying that maybe Jesus rose physically maybe they would get, say okay maybe he did do that but believers don't like you and me when we rise from the dead we will just rise spiritually, our bodies are going to stay here. They were beginning to believe that. As a matter of fact, um, look at verse 12. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That was starting to be said in the Corinthian church, that there is no resurrection from the dead. They may have started to doubt whether Jesus physically rose, only spiritually, and they were almost definitely saying nobody actually gets their bodies back and rises physically. They just rise spiritually. That's what they, and you might say, well, I don't think that makes, makes a big difference. You know, there are parts of the Bible that I don't fully understand. But even when I don't understand them, I must accept them until I do understand them. You cannot, what you need to be doing is getting more under gaining more understanding of the Bible all the time. And what I'm a little afraid about in our culture, in our church, is fewer and fewer people really know what the Bible says and they really don't think it matters that much. Like, if Jesus rose spiritually, he rose physically, what's it matter? That's how we think. That, but sometimes there are far-reaching um, consequences with that matter of fact if you don't believe that jesus rose physically if you don't when you get saved if you don't believe he actually rose physically from the dead the bible says you're not really a christian it is consequential if you're not a christian you don't go to heaven it is very consequential 
By the way, I mentioned that you can't be saved unless you believe that Jesus rose physically. And some of you might be saying, well, you know, I don't really get into it that much. That's what I'm scared about. More and more of our culture says, well, the Bible's really hard to understand. Um, I think I'm doing just fine. I'm a Christian. I'll, you know, and they be, have that kind of attitude. Well, with that kind of attitude, here our, our minds cannot exist that way and be healthy. If you are not letting the word of God dwelling you, dwell in you richly, in other words, you're not just oozing with meditating on God's word, letting it guide your thoughts, guide your actions, guide your words. If you're not trying to understand it and learning more and more of it every day, by default, your opinions are filling in the gaps, the philosophy of the world is filling in the gaps, and you are starting to stand on sinking sand, and the advice you give is sinking sand. It's scary. I am, I am concerned. I don't know where I should be on this. Sometimes when I, I talk to people, in, in, even in our church, I don't know if they're really saved. That's not up to me. I can't see the heart. But when I ask them, well, how did you get saved? I'll hear things like, well, you know, I, I was in a bad car wreck and I really started talking to God. And um, I got in church and I've been trying to honor God. And, you know... Maybe the Holy Spirit is working. That is not how you get saved. Is that what you would tell me? If I'm dying and you're going to tell me how to be saved, become a Christian, are you going to tell me just to, you know, get in church and uh, you know, start feeling good toward God? That's not going to work. That's not the gospel. There's only one saving message. The word gospel means the message that saves, the saving message. And there's, all, there's always only been one. And it'll never change. It's, it, you don't tamper with it. If you tamper with the gospel message, it immediately loses its power. And it doesn't save. So are you really saved this morning? I, I want to be careful how I, I say that. I'm not trying to make you doubt. I'm really not. But I hear so much, like when somebody joins our church, we ask them, would you tell us how you got saved? Now, why? Because we, would, we want to do some investigation. It has nothing to do with that. Every deacon or pastor that would sit and ask you that question was a filthy, dirt, dirty, rotten sinner. And by the grace of God, they were saved. And the last thing we want you to do is think that, yes, you can become a member of the church, and that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, I think I'm in. I, I think I'm a Christian. And yet, we have not, if we hear you say something other than the gospel, you may not be a Christian at all. We let you join, and you actually think you're even more a Christian. That's a scary thing. So this morning, I would offer this to you. If you have some serious doubts of whether you're a Christian, don't walk out of here today without making sure. You can be absolutely sure today that you're a Christian. So we're going to go over this. Jesus, well, the, the Bible tells us that if you don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can't be saved. Now, that's only a part of it. Let's read the text. We'll read most of it here. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 15. He said, Paul says, now this he says he's talking to people he believes are his Christian brothers and sisters because he says, now I want to remind you, brothers. So he's talking to people he believes are in the family of God. And most of them were. But apparently some of them weren't, or at least as Christians, they started to dilute the gospel. Now watch this. Now I want, I would, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preach to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Let me read that again. If you hold fast to the word that I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, could it be that there are people in this room this morning, I'm not trying to be dramatic, have you believed in vain? Your, your belief was off. You're, as the lady sang, leaning, you were leaning on the wrong thing. Your, your faith was in the wrong place. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now what Paul is saying here, he says, the gospel message, I didn't come up with it. It's not my version of how you get saved. I received it. It came to me as a package. It's the same package that gets, in a sense, mailed to everybody. 
I received it, I, and I have kept it intact, and I am giving it exactly to you. This is how a person can know that they're saved. He says uh, again in verse 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared. And he starts talking about how he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. What he's stressing here is that it was a physical appearance. Okay, he's stressing that. Now there's more to the gospel than just that Jesus rose from the dead, but that was the one part they were beginning to chip away at there in Corinth. If you chip away at any of the gospel, uh, you depower it. If, you're, if you believe anything other than what I'm going to say this morning, it's very possible your belief has been in vain and you're not saved. It says he appeared to Cephas. I'm going to save the rest of that until next Sunday. He scolds them down in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Now, why would they begin to tamper with... I mean, have, you, have any of you ever thought, well, maybe Jesus didn't rise physically, but I'm sure he rose spiritually. Some of you have never even thought those thoughts. But they were thinking these thoughts. Why would they begin to tamper with the gospel message? Because it says there in verse um, 4 that he was buried. And since you don't bury a spirit, that's a body. And he was raised. It's talking about bodily resurrection on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he is, see, he is seen by Cephas or Peter. He's seen by 500 people at one time. And, uh, and more than that. So he's emphasizing the bodily resurrection. So why would they start saying, you know what? And they started to say it. Maybe Jesus didn't rise physically, he only rose spiritually, and definitely believers, we don't rise physically, we just rise in our spirits. Or once we die, our bodies go into the grave or disintegrate, whatever. Um, but why would they even do that? Why would they start talking like that? Well, Embarrassment. That's what I believe is the number one reason. They were embarrassed of the gospel message. Yeah. Because, in, let me read this from, uh, this is from Warren Wearsby. He says this, Corinth was a Greek city, and the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. When Paul preached at Athens and declared the fact of Christ's resurrection, some of his li listeners actually laughed at him. Most Greek philosophers considered the human body a prison, and they welcomed death as deliverance from bondage. And somehow this skeptical attitude had come into the church. You see, in their culture, they hated their bodies, or they thought that their body had no effect on their soul. Some of them thought that your body, go ahead and sin, do whatever you want with it, because it's your spirit that gets saved, it doesn't matter. And some of them just flat out hated their flesh and couldn't wait to die and be delivered from the bondage of a fleshly body. It was a strange belief, but that's how the Greeks believed back then. It, it pervaded the culture. And so when the Christians would come around and say they believe that Jesus rose physically from the dead and they believe that one day their bodies would rise physically from the dead and be glorified, you know what happened in their culture? People laughed at them. People looked at them like, are you crazy? That's disgusting. It, then you didn't want to keep your body after death in the Greek culture. They, when, when the Christian church would preach that, the culture around them said, that is sickening. Oh, wow. No, no. They said, that it's crazy message. And they would just write them off. Well, like all of us, I remember I, was, I went walking every morning with a friend of mine, and he was not a Christian. He was in a cult, actually. And uh, I liked his friendship a lot. And I didn't want to tell him the truth. And you know why? I didn't want to lose his friendship. I didn't want him to think I was strange. But finally one day I said to him, hey, can I, can I talk to you? And I shared the gospel with him. Okay. Believe it or not, he came to church the next Sunday. Never came back again. Okay. Yeah. That's not funny. I'm a good preacher. 
Anyhow, he never came back. But my point was this. I was, I was uh, tempted to be embarrassed by the gospel a little bit. I didn't want him to think, um, I didn't want him to look down on me or think I was kind of a nut. You see, it's very, it's very enticing for Christians. We still want to be cool. We still want to be accepted by the world. If you really told people what you believe, I mean, think about it. Politically, can you tell people how you vote nowadays? Well, some of you are saying yes. Okay. But my point is, a lot of us feel a, a temptation to keep things hidden. Because we're, for example, I listed a few, and Paul dealt with most of these, like saying that the Christian way of being saved is the only way to be saved. Is it easy to say that? Is it easy to say in, that um, two people not married should not be sleeping together? Is that popular today? Homosexuality is a sin. Yeah. Abortion is wrong. Submitting, and the only way to truly have happiness in this life is to focus on pleasing God. Holiness is the road to happiness. If you try to be happy without being holy, you won't be happy and you won't be holy. But if you will strive to be holy, you'll be happy too. The greatest way to live your life is every day surrender your will to God. But that's not a popular message. Most people wake up and some gated villages around here and gated places and whatever, and they th wake up every day, how, how much fun can I have? They don't give a thought to, does my life please God? And you're saying you, that should be your first thought. There is a heaven. There is a hell. And people who do not get saved go to hell. Now, that mess, those few things that I said, okay, more and more of the culture around us looks at us with disgust. What do you mean to tell me? Everybody sleeps together now. Are you telling me God's going to send people to hell for that? And that's how they might say it. You mean to tell me that if God made people that way, made them to be homosexuals, and now he's judging them for being homosexuals? That's how they'll say it. My point is, and so what you find is many churches are saying, there was a church here I noticed in the, our newspaper that was happy to say since 19, I don't know what the date was, but it was early on, like 1984, we openly uh, allow uh, gay people to join our churches and to be pastors and all that kind of stuff in our church. They were proud of that. Now, some of you actually right now might be uncomfortable to think, this church believes that crazy, wicked stuff and horrible things. We do. Because it's in the Bible. And I could dumb it down. I could not preach on that. But you know what I've done? I robbed the Bible of power. Especially if you take away from the gospel message, which is the power of God to save people. You cannot compromise on that. And sometimes we do it because, well, gosh, I, I just want to fit in. I, I, I don't want people to know I'm that weird and I believe that stuff. I tell you, you'd be a lot better off to obey the word of God even when you don't understand it than to try to explain it away or say you don't believe it. It scares me when denominations begin to cut verses out of their Bibles. It scares me. It scares me that some of you have come from churches like that perhaps. And their ideas, and I, I, I see these bumper stickers, coexist, coexist. Now actually, I believe in some of that. Should we be... Um, should we be assaulting people in cults? Or should we uh, uh, be uh, picketing their houses and throwing eggs at their houses? Of course not. We've got to coexist in that sense. Yes. They, have, they can believe whatever they want. But the underlying idea is that we all coexist because we're all equal. We're all valid ways. It's not true. It's not true. I saw a bumper sticker again, and sometimes I... I want to at least see their heart in this. We shouldn't be fighting. No, we shouldn't be fighting, but that does not mean I agree with their doctrine. And I, we should point out, if you believe that, you will not go to heaven. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. 
I saw another bumper sticker that says, God is too big to fit into any religion, into just one religion, that's what it said. God is too big to fit into one religion. I try to give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't like religion, to be honest with you. I like relationship, okay? I do. But what they're actually saying is that all religions, God transcends them and that, that all religions, in one sense, have, have all, they're all at least valid or we're all about the same. Is what they're actually saying. That's not true. Can't be true. So, so they were embarrassed. When they would speak what their faith actually uh, believed in their culture, people looked down on them and laughed at them. And so they began to, we call it capitulate. A better word is they began to accommodate. They began to de-emphasize that part. And to the point where, and here, it's always coupled with this. They were embarrassed and they apparently stopped studying the word of God. Can I please tell you, that's why we have different class, We have Sunday night church. We have Thursday night classes. We have a Bible institute. We have discipleship. We have small groups. It's why you need to be in these things so that you are growing in your knowledge of the word. Because God takes the word of God and his Holy Spirit and he teaches you. And if you don't, if you are not growing in your understanding of God's word and being changed by the Holy Spirit, if you're not having that happen to you, by default, you're starting to believe your own opinions and the opinions of the world around you. And you'll find yourself accommodating because you don't want to be embarrassed. Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to God. We shouldn't be this way. I don't care, they say to the world, I don't care what you think of me, I, you know, and be real arrogant. No, no. In one sense, I remember a, a good preacher uh, that I listened to, Jeff um, Adams out of Kansas City Baptist Temple. I don't, I don't think he's even, he may not even be pastoring anymore. He says, you know, you don't have to be obnoxious. He says the, the gospel's obnoxious all on its own. It tells you you're a sinner. Yeah. Are you truly saved? And by here, let me say it this way. Are you truly saved and not according to your opinion, but according to the word of God, are you saved? According to the Bible. Not according to some religion that you've been a part of, even if it's had the name Baptist on it. Are you saved? Not according to your opinion, but according to the word of God. as it, It's standard. People who do this are saved. People who believe this are saved. I invite you today to move from, this is your opportunity to move from darkness to light, to move from haziness to certainty. There are many people who I think they struggle, they don't know if they're saved, and maybe this will help you this morning. Learn the scriptures, live the scriptures, share the scriptures. We have, I realize more and more, I, I've been able to go kind of be undercover Christian for many years. People may not even realize I'm saved because I just seem pretty normal. You know, I fit in pretty well around everything, you know. Well, more and more, though, our world, world has changed so much that if I live for Christ at all, I'm going to stick out sometimes. And there's a temptation to kind of back that in a little. Don't back it in. Our, our world needs to know that there is a right and a wrong. They need to know, not as a, not this way, but they're, oh my goodness, if you don't get on the right path, You'll eternally miss heaven. It is, it is of great consequence. So, let's go to verses 1 and 2. And I just want to go through them. If you would, in your notes, I've outlined this. I think it will be helpful. I hope it will be. I'm just going to take these two verses phrase by phrase. And this is how you get saved. Now, the gospel's listed, really, in the later verses, verses 3 and following. But this is how you have to um, receive this message. It says there in chapter 15, verse 1, the first phrase, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. Let's talk about this phrase a little bit. It means there is just one message that saved, saves. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I delivered to you. It was a complete package. Okay. He delivered to them in 
in its completeness. And he had to remind them why. We kind of begin to waver a little bit. Well, you know, maybe those people can be saved. Maybe that religion still people can get saved. No, the only way, religion doesn't save anyone. But this right here, what I'm reading to you, it saves. Okay. There's just one message that saves. All other ground is seeking sand. There's been no changes in it. Number two, which you received. To be saved, the gospel message must be received as completely true. Well, and the gospel message is in verses 3 and 4, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again, and appeared. And he did that for your sins, for mine. You have to receive this. To be saved, the gospel message must be received as completely true. This speaks of a one-time conscious decision. And what I'm, this is probably the, the sticking point, is people, they can't tell me when they got saved. That is strange. There are some times when I know the work of the Spirit is mysterious. I get that. I would call it a gestation period. There are times when you're considering, what's, is, God, is, is God real? Is, is the Bible telling me the truth? And you're thinking about it, you're debating it. And yes, that's kind of a, that could be a month-long process or a weeks-long process. But there finally comes this moment where you say, I receive. You know, Michelle and I, we just sold our house. Okay? And so in the period leading up to our selling our house, they gave us an offer, you know, we countered. Or, and we had to fix certain things, do certain things. All this stuff was happening, happening, happening. Then there came a day when with, <clears throat> in my right mind and consciously, in a sense, without emotion, I said, I received their offer officially and I signed my name. Done deal. One time, one time uh, a decision. And guess what it did? It made the house theirs. It was binding. It was an official decision. Okay. And see, when you get saved, there might be this period where, in a sense, the, like the baby's in the womb, but then there's that day when you are born again. Born again. The day when you go from darkness to light. The, the thinking about it can take a while. But the decision is like that. And it's not, it's not that it's not an emotional decision. I think most of the time it is, and I think that's a good thing. That you realize that the gentleman that got saved a couple weeks ago, he said, five minutes after he got saved, he said, you know, I feel like a burden's been lifted off of me. Well, that's right. That's okay. Emotion is good. But some people only make emotional decisions. We'll get to that. But the point is, I made a conscious decision to receive that offer, and as soon as I signed it, and Michelle signed it, it was a done deal, one-time decision, the house became theirs. And when you get saved, it's the same way. You, I, what I would recommend so many of you to do, some of you have come, and I, when I ask you how you get saved, and I mean, I mean to be kind. Oh, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just concerned. Because when you tell me whether or not you're saved, it's, it's a real broad, hazy kind of thing. You don't have to remember the exact day. I don't remember what day I got saved, but I do remember the time. When I went, I realized all the struggle in my heart, and I came right up to this moment, <gasps> I need to be saved. In a sense, I need to sign on the dotted line. I need to officially accept Jesus as my Savior. And I did. In that moment, I was saved. I went from darkness to light. I went from a child of Satan to a child of God. There's no gradual thing with this. Do, I would ask you, ink the deal. You may say, well, I've always loved God. Some people have said to me, I just feel like I've always been with God. I feel like he's always been my savior. That's, that's not true. All we like sheep have gone astray. All we have sinned and turned from God. Everybody, no exception. There has to be that time when you make the Lord your shepherd. That time, that instant. I think a lot of people struggle with doubt. They don't know if they're saved. Why? As I think they have never inked the deal. In one sense, I could say you might be saved. But if I was you, here's what I would do. I would say, Lord, I have nothing against you. I feel like I've loved you all my life, but I want to be sure today. And right now, I don't know what I did in the past. But I ask you right now, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you're the only way. I, put all, you know, I believe you rose from the grave. 
conquered death. And I put all my hope. I lean on you for salvation. Save me. Forgive me. Come into my life. Take over. I go your way. Make it official. Make it official. And then the other thing, be baptized. Mark the moment. That doesn't say, um, baptism doesn't save, but it's a declaration of somebody, I am proud to be saved. He saved me. I'm on his team. I'm in his family. Yeah. Number three. In which you stand. This gospel message alone must be relied on for salvation. That's faith. In which you stand. If you say, I, I'm standing on this. I'm standing, I'm depending on this. It's what you're saying. You're not saved because you believe the Bible. You're not saved because you're trying to abide by the Bible. You're not saved because you think Jesus is okay. You're not even saved because you believe that he rose from the dead as a fact. There's much more to it. You can't be saved without it, but that alone doesn't save. You can't just believe that the resurrection is a, is a historical fact. You have to lean on it. You're trusting in this to get you to heaven. You're, not, you're depending on nothing else, not, not any works, not any goodness in you, because i got to tell you, guess how much good you have in you before you got saved? Zero. Zero. And some people are very offended by that, but guess how much good works I had in me before I got saved? Zero. Actually, I wasn't even zero. I was full, according to the Bible, of dead men's bones and sins. So the gospel message alone must be relied on. That's what faith is for salvation. Number four, and by which you are being saved. You see, now, most new translations translate it that way because there, it is, it has that in the Greek, it has that tense. When you get saved, it is forever and it is complete, but it's in the process of saving you. It's a process that begins. The theological word for it is progressive sanctification whether you remember that or not but when you get saved God goes to work in your life and he begins to transform you transform you you're born into it so you're just a baby and he wants you to become like an adult and what adult does he want you to become like Jesus Christ that's it so he's God works through his word through the Holy Spirit and with life circumstances to get you to be a mature Christian like Jesus Christ that pro and by the way that's how we can know that someone may not be a Christian is because when they get saved there's no change there's no progressive change occurring in their lives I'm not talking about perfect they become perfect I'm saying they are start, starting to be perfected by God number five if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Now, that word there, he doesn't mean if you hold to the, the Bible. He, he's, saying, he's talking about the gospel message. That word there means the gospel message. You're saved if you never tamper with the gospel message. People who will begin to tamper with the, the gospel message, sometimes that's evidence. If they start to say, well, you know, I used to believe that Jesus was the only way, but come on. How are the Buddhists and the Hindus going to get to heaven? I think Jesus has many names all over the world, and so they can go, you can get to him even by a different name, all right? Well, that sounds attractive, you know, but it's not the truth. Those who truly get saved, they'll never tamper with the gospel message. And see, the Corinthians, though they had been truly saved, most of them, they were tempted to start tampering with that. And Paul's saying that's a serious thing. People who tamper with the message of the gospel are giving evidence that they don't really rely on it. They're relying on other things or other things are just as valid. That's a dangerous thing. Number six, unless you believed in vain. Now that's the scary one. You know that scary passage in Matthew chapter seven where people stand before the Lord one day and they say, they say to him, Lord, Lord. And he says, you call me Lord, Lord, but you're, you're not, I've never known you. You've never been my child. 
and they, they don't go into heaven. And they say, well, I was in church, and I did many great things, and I, I know you. He says, I don't know you. They have believed in vain. It's a scary thought. And the truth is, we all, a little sweat should come up on all of our brows when we read a passage like that. That's why Paul says, examine whether you're in the faith. Do a little self-examination. You do it like this. Search me, O God. Tell me. Am I saved according to your word? Not according to what my church says. Not according to how my opinion says. Not according to what the world says. But what the Bible says. It is possible, this is number six, it is possible that people can make an emotional or shallow decision about Christ rather than an informed, deliberate decision. The person who does this will not go to heaven, but will eventually abandon the exclusivity of the gospel and the authority of Scripture. People who just, like, here's what often happens. People, and by the way, almost all the time, a crisis brings us to God. Uh, A relationship goes bad. Our health goes bad. Our finances go bad. Some big burden in our lives and we finally don't have anywhere else to turn and we come to church and we come to the Lord. Now all of us, practically all of us do that. There's nothing wrong with that. We come there, but what happens sometimes is we ask God to help us out in a jam at the moment. There's not really a conscious, deliberate decision to put your faith in Him as your only Savior and Lord. It really is God, help me. I need you, I believe in you, and it's a shallow decision. It's not really thought through. It's not really conscious, it's not deliberate. It's not like when Michelle and I, by the way, when we, maybe you, maybe you have so much money that when you buy and sell houses, you just say, you sign anything, you don't care, you don't even read it or look at it. We didn't do that. Okay. It was a, it was a serious decision. Let me tell you, being saved is a serious decision, but it can be the most joyful one. Are you sure? Are you sure? But many people, they'll make this shallow decision. They just, they were um, discouraged or upset about something and they kind of get close to God for a while, but quickly it just kind of fades away. And then they kind of believe anything. Then they say, yeah, I went to that church and they said, believe in Jesus, and that's probably true, but you know, and they start easily are swayed that there are many gospel messages, easily swayed that the Bible might need to be updated. Those are signs of people who really didn't get saved. Because if you really get saved, I love the gospel message more today than I did when I got saved. You fall more in love with it. You wouldn't tamper with it at all. You know it's the only hope of the world. Number seven, so I ask you, have you made an informed, deliberate decision to receive Jesus as your only Savior and Lord? Have you done that? Admitting your sinful condition, believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and rose physically from the grave, and relying on Jesus alone for forgiveness of sins and relinquishing control of your life into his hands. Have you done that? Let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. Let's have everybody bow your heads. Now, some of you actually amen when I was praying and you you believe exactly what I'm saying maybe the vast majority maybe 100% but this morning if you say Mike if you if you couldn't write down exactly how to be saved if it didn't involve admitting your sin and inability and turning to Jesus Christ as your only hope and relying completely and only on him for your salvation calling on him to save you if that if that doesn't describe the decision you made it can't be just something happened or i just changed or whatever if you have that and i'm going to tell you you might be saved but you're going to wonder and doubt and you shouldn't you you are not able to transfer that to anyone you can't tell anyone else and and satan is going to dog you with doubt forever Let's erase the doubt. And would you make a deliberate, conscious decision to say, Lord, I don't know what I did in the past. I don't know, but I know right now that I love you. You love me. I am a sinner. I was a sinner. Without you, I will remain a sinner. I ask you to come into my life and forgive all my sins. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I ask you to come in and take control of my life. Would you do that right now? Let's just pray. and Just whisper these words. If you mean them in your heart, and I'm telling you, 
if you mean these in your heart and will say them to him, he will save you. And you can, in a sense, ink the deal. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know that you love me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I don't know what I've done in the past. I'm not so sure. But I know what I'm doing right now. I ask you to save me. Forgive my sins. I believe you died on the cross for those sins and rose again. And I ask you to come into my life and take control right now. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you did that, if you did that, you need to tell me. It's, it's not a decision you should say, I'm not going to tell anybody. No, it's a decision you want to tell. And you need to be baptized. If you've never, and there may be a lot of murkiness, I wrote it this way, let's move out of the craziness and the haziness into the certainty. Do you know for sure you're saved? You can. I hope you prayed that prayer if you weren't sure. And that will be your message. Amen. If anyone to ask you, why are you so hopeful? Why do you have joy? Well, I've been saved, and here's how you can be saved. Amen. It's a lot to think about. Let's pray.